Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the monthly Eduversal webinar Beyond the Class uh, April series. Uh, this is our monthly webinar to provide professional development for teachers or educators, not only in Indonesia, but also across the nation. Before we start our session today, let's uh, watch a video about our uh, program, Edunav. digital serta lebih mudah mengevaluasi dan melaporkan perkembangan siswa di sekolah sebagai bahan perencanaan perkembangan pendidikan di masa depan. Selain itu, orang tua juga dimudahkan dalam memantau kegiatan dan prestasi anaknya di sekolah, sehingga orang tua bisa melakukan penanganan dengan lebih cepat jika prestasi sang anak mengalami penurunan atau jika terjadi masalah yang melibatkan sang anak. Begitu juga ketika sang anak berprestasi di sekolahnya, orang tua bisa dengan mudah mengetahui sehingga dapat memberikan dukungan ke pada sang anak. EduNav dapat menyajikan laporan berdasarkan kebutuhan manajemen sekolah serta sesuai dengan standar dan sistem pendidikan sekolah yang bersangkutan. Dengan adanya EduNav, iklim pendidikan di sekolah diharapkan akan memiliki kualitas yang baik. EduNav tidak sekedar sistem informasi sekolah biasa. Dengan EduNav, kami berupaya menciptakan sistem pendidikan yang efektif. because the video that didn't have sound in the first place could you please to replay again the video about the edunav so the edunav is a school <clears throat> management system all right so i think um that's enough okay uh i'd like to Uh, greet everybody again. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Zikri Rahmat Ramadan, and I will be the moderator of today's session. Our topic for today is Introduction to Project-Based Learning, Creativity in Action. Um, through this webinar, you will learn about skills needed for the 21st century students. And then switching our teaching and learning approach from content-based to skill-based. Engaging students to manage their own learning. Examples of unleashing student potential and some best practices of creativity in action. With our today's presenter, Mr. Sinan Kosak. Uh, hello, Mr. Sinan Kosak. How are you today? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Hello. I'm very well, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to have your presence today to share with us all. Uh, before we get started, I would like to introduce our presenter. Um, Sinan Kosak graduated with Bachelor of Science in Physics Education from Middle East Technical University, Turkey in year 2000. He holds master degree in business administration from University of Bucharest, Romania. Uh, Mr. Sinan also has 13 years of experience as physics educator and seven years as principal and director of international school in Bucharest. 
uh, Mr. Sinan is now an educational consultant, consul, uh, Council of International School accredit, Accreditation Evaluator, and also as board member for International School in Bucharest. Uh, with all the experience, Mr. Sinan will share with us about uh, project-based learning. And I would like to um, remind the, particip to the participants to remain muted during the webinar unless the presenter asks you to speak. And also, you can write your questions in the group chat if you have questions during the webinar. Okay, I think it is time to begin the presentation. Are you ready, Mr. Sinan? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, then time is yours. Let me share the screen first and check with you. Are you able to see the screen? Yes, we can see it clearly. Excellent. So good morning from Romania, Bucharest, and good afternoon in uh, Indonesia and all other parts of the world. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor and privilege for me to join your session. And um, uh, I'm, very, uh, feeling, I'm feeling very happy to share my experiences and uh, hopefully answer your questions today. So um, our title, as uh, Mr. Zikri said, Introduction to Project-Based Learning, in short, PBL. And uh, we will look at some examples as creativity in action. So what I'm going to talk about today, first of all, uh, we will look at some skills needed for the 21st century education. And uh, at the end of this uh, webinar, uh, I hope you will find answers to those questions. What makes us learn more effectively? How do we learn better? Why PBL, project-based learning, is important? What are the benefits? And what is the definition of high-quality PBL in general? According to some research and strong evidence, how can we define a quality, high quality PBL? What is the difference between doing a project and project-based learning? This is something we will also try to discover. And uh, at the end, as I said, I will try to share plenty of examples, case studies, and to I will try to tell you how we want to talk in general. This is the content uh, in brief, but let me just tell you a short story first. This is the story of Richard Torreira and his limelights. He's a 12 year old Maasai boy living in Kenya in a small village. And uh, their village is at the edge of a very big national park. His family and everyone in the village, of course, rely on farm animals and uh, they have cows. And this uh, young boy is responsible to take care of them. It's their livestock. But they have a big, very big problem, huge challenge. It's protecting their animals from the lions in the national park. Because especially at night, lions attack their cows and this results in a lot of damage and they kill them. As a result, they kill the lions. So um, he is very upset with this situation and uh, he's always trying to find some solutions. Richard tried to, for example, use fire he, and he had some torch, torchlight to repel the lions at night. And he has seen that they don't really care. I mean, even though you have the light in your hand, Lines still attack. But this brave boy noticed later that when he is walking with the light, they didn't attack. So a moving light or blinking the light or the fire can actually repel the lines and he can actually protect the cows. So 
he got an idea. He said, what if I make a project? What if I have a circuit? Because he was very interested in science and electronics in general, in general. And he had a very creative idea. And that's his sketch of his project. He used the car battery powered by a solar cell also recharged. He attached a switch to this simple circuit and he took an indicator box from a motorcycle. When he made the complete circuit with the light bulbs around the fence, together with the transformer and the indicator box, the lights started to turn on and off. So imagine the whole fence and the lights are on and off continuously. This gave the impression to the lines as if the light is moving. So he was able to protect animals. They didn't start, they didn't attack the cows anymore. His project became very famous and he installed this in other villages. And uh, this resulted in for him to become a TED speaker. I really recommend you to watch his speech on TED. It's really inspiring, amazing talk. And he received a scholarship from one of the best international schools in Kenya. So his creativity didn't just save him and his future, but also the lives of the lions and the cows. So my question here from this story is, why don't we have so many students like him? Even at schools that we invest millions of euros, why don't we always motivate or encourage, engage our students to do some real life projects that can change their lives. Maybe, of course, we don't see a line every night, so uh, our situation is a bit different, but still there is a, uh, I think a problem in education in general. And I would like to show you this slide to face the reality. This is from Tom here in, um, I just found it on a Facebook post. And uh, he says, we have a problem with the educational system. We have a challenge because we are having 21st century kids taught by 20th century adults, the teachers, and we are using 19th century curriculum with the techniques mostly from the 18th century or uh, according to the calendar from the 18th century. So, how we can actually overcome these problems when none of these jobs today existed 20 years ago? How can we prepare our students for the future? I think this is the biggest challenge of education today because we move in a circle around the same routines and the global world is rapidly changing today we have these jobs that didn't exist 20 years ago. SEO specialist, YouTuber, Uber driver, podcast producer, drone pilot, AI engineer, due to GDPR in Europe especially, data protection officer, or a life coach or blockchain developer. So how our students are getting ready with the skills needed for today's jobs? Let's pause here now a little and then think about the future because this is something also related with the future jobs. We don't know how the future would look like, but we know that there would be these kind of jobs and uh, maybe some others that are not invented yet. And they will require some special skills and competences. Imagine a brain implant specialist or space tourism guide, end of life coach or holographic designer, self-driving car mechanic and artificial intelligence lawyer. Recently, maybe you have heard in the news, uh, an autonomous car had an accident, for example, a self-driving car having an accident and killing people. So people are now talking about the AI lawyers to defend the rights of the automobiles or the companies behind them. So 
We have all sorts of new questions, challenges, and some new skills and competences needed to resolve them. And these skills, according to a lot of research and um, uh, agreement by social scientists and educators, these skills are basically the four C's of the 21st century skills. We can tell critical thinking, collaboration, and communication as three of these C's, skills needed. And at the core of all these skills, we have creativity, innovation. So creativity is a must skill, is an important skill that we really need to transfer to our students during their education and schools. I want you to think about the most watched TED talk. If I show you the photo, maybe you will remember. Sir Ken Robinson, his talk on TED, which is uh, basically telling that schools kill creativity had 70 million views so far. So it's really interesting that we are here, educators always prove, trying to prove the opposite, but at least not to say, to say that we are not uh, those schools, not all schools actually kill creativity and we are all working towards that. So what should we do? I think uh, maybe we should look back to what we have learned from the history, what we learned from our experiences, even for uh, thousands of years. How do we learn more effectively? I think that's a good starting point. A Chinese proverb, or some people say it's credited to Confucius, says that I hear, I forget. I see and I remember, I do and then I understand. So learning by doing can be a starting point. Maybe we should focus as teachers more on teaching and learning by doing, by practical applications. This is uh, sometimes called Dale's cone of experience, and it tells us how we actually learn, what kind of stimulus or sensors we use for our learning. Of course, reading, hearing, viewing images, watching videos, or attending exhibi exhibitions or sites. These are all important. They help us learn, but these are all limited in general. If you look at this part of the pyramid, the cone, these are all passive learning styles. In order to learn actively, in order to retain the information that we have, we need to look at the lower part of the pyramid. Participating in hands-on activities or collaboration, simulations, modeling, experiencing, touching, designing a presentation, or in brief, doing the real thing. This is where we have active learning. And I think this is the base of the PBL, project-based learning. This is what PBL is trying to do, is trying to engage students with active learning by doing the real thing. Let's now have a quick look at uh, some research studies. What does the research say about PBL and learning by doing? In 1989, a research uh, concludes that the more sensory channels possible in interacting with the resource, the better chance that many students can learn from it. So if you actually initiate more sensory channels during your teaching and learning, you have a better chance to make them learn what you teach. 
Another research from NTL Institute in 1998, it says most effective approaches resulting in 75% to 90% retention rates are learning by doing and teaching others. So students learn much, much better when they actually learn by doing and they actually teach what they learned to the others. In 95, another research found that uh, effective teachers implement more learner-centered, student-centered activities, and they involve critical thinking, hands-on activities, and these teachers are more effective. And Duke and his friends in 2017 uh, found uh, uh, statistically a very big difference between a PBL group and the control group in two domains, in social studies and uh, reading. And they have seen that 63% of the students in the PBL group had higher scores, achievements, than the other control groups, control group, and 23% higher for the informational reading in the control group. So PBL doesn't only engage the learners, it is also, contributing to the attainment and achievement. I have found recently a, a very uh, new study, a two gold standard uh, research about PBL. Uh, one of them was in 2020, and the last one is this year, actually. And these controlled trials with thousands of students uh, showed that uh, project-based learning significantly outperformed traditional curricula. I'm going to show you some data related with this research in the next uh, couple of slides, but uh, please note that this study was made over 6,000 students from over 100 schools across the nation, and uh, half of the students, almost half, from were from low-income households. So they were careful about the study group. They didn't only look at the best schools or very good students according to their uh, achievements. They had a very nice, uh, very wide group of range of group of students to test uh, their hypothesis. And this is what they found. In one of the studies uh, with about 3,600 students, the project-based learning class outperformed, made, I mean, scored much better from those in the traditional advanced placement classes. So almost 10% or 6% of increase uh, in this uh, first research according to the test results, the pass rates. PBL class performed better. In the second study, which was done with about 2,300, 400 students, and uh, here also uh, they looked at the scores of science in general and compared the students' reading level with their scores. And as you can see, uh, the green and the blue uh, bars in the graph, the traditional uh, teaching methods versus PBL, the PBL class significantly performed much better across all reading percentiles. So this was a very strong evidence and uh, a good research for us to tell the benefits of the PBL learning by doing project-based learning in our schools. So how can we define PBL then? Project-based learning is a learner-centered approach. So we place the student at the center and they have the opportunity to participate collaboration, collaborated activities. They don't work individually, they work as a team. And they are having some real life opportunities. In PBL, we have real life applications. 
And this way they are engaged in constructing their learning and their learning is personally meaningful. They have a personal interest in their learning. It's authentic. And this enables students to engage in their learning by investigating an authentic question or a problem. So the role of the teacher in PBL is different. It's switching the approach from content-based teaching to skill-based teaching. The teacher is not just delivering the curriculum or the syllabus. He is the supervisor or a coach supporting students during the process as they gain new skills and showcase their creativity by doing PBL. Let me now uh, pause here a little bit and tell you the difference between doing a project and project-based learning. I think we all as teachers uh, gave projects to the students sometime in our uh, teaching career. But I want you to uh, really uh, pay attention to the difference between doing a project and PBL, project-based learning. If doing a project is uh, like a dessert, the main course is the PBL. I can show you the difference uh, with this table uh, and it will be, I think, more clear. In doing a project, we have an add-on to the traditional instruction. So we teach our subject and at the end of the unit, we ask students to do a project to extend their knowledge or to enhance their uh, skills or information. But in the project-based learning, the PBL is the unit itself. So our instruction is integrated into the project. We are teaching as students are doing their project. So it's the main course. Doing a project is like for fun. You finish your main course, you eat a light, nice dinner, and then you have a small dessert. But in PBL, we have some other criteria, some other standards. In doing a project, the teacher is following the, uh, gives the directions to the, to the student. The teacher is telling what to do, how to do, in what order. But in the PBL, the students have inquiry. They, have, uh, they, have, they are the decision makers. They take the lead. So it's driven by the student inquiry. In doing a project, teachers look at the result on the product itself, the presentation or the model, whatever it is. In PBL, we look at the result, of course, but we also focus on the process. What students actually gain during this process, what skills they have developed by doing this uh, project. In doing a project, we have mostly standards and skills uh, placed sideways, but in the PBL, we align the standards and success skills to the project. So um, the, the standards and the final outcomes are perfectly parallel to the academic standards and the skills that we want them to achieve. As I said earlier, doing a project can be done alone. Students can try at home by themselves. But in PBL, collaboration is a key, either in class, outside the school, by the support of the student, teachers, students work in groups. So as a result, uh, doing a project remains in the school mostly, or in the classroom. But in PBL, we have a real world context an application in the outside world. So in doing a project, we have the result displaced, presented in class, but in PBL, this goes beyond the classroom and it's a public product 
you actually present your work, students work uh, outside the classroom, outside the school even sometimes, because you involve people from outside the class. So this is the uh, table I got from the Buck Institute for Education. Uh, they are doing uh, a lot of research and producing a lot of resources for PBL for many years, working with hundreds of scientists and uh, educational uh, experts in this area. And one of the things they have actually done in the Buck Institute for Education is the framework for high quality PBL. And I want to spend some time on this slide to explain each standard for you. Um, when we say PBL, everybody can understand a different thing. Each, each teacher can apply a different method, can have his or her own standards. So uh, this institute uh, worked together with the educational and educators, and they came up with a framework. They defined the high quality PBL with six criteria. And uh, this way, after having feedback from 100 educators and experts in the field and continuous support and feedback on their website since 2016, uh, they have published their results and uh, produced some gold standards for a high quality PBL project. This way they are aiming to help educators and teachers from all around the world to meet with the same standards so that PBL based on the research can be done more meaningfully, more effectively. So the first uh, criteria, the first domain here is the intellectual challenge, as you can see. Students in PBL learn deeply, they think critically, and they are trying, doing their best for excellence. So they confronted by uh, some challenging problem and the learning is more meaningful for them. And this way, they can easily remember what they have learned in the future. So the PBL is going beyond a simple Google search. They deep dive into the subject over a planned process, a period of time. And it's a student activity. Other adults like teachers, parents, community members, they take a supportive role here. Teachers, as I said earlier, like coach, uh, coaches or mentors, and they are building skills and confidence for the students. So instruction does not really occur, happen uh, for the sake of the syllabus or the curriculum. It uh, happens because students really need them to learn, to accomplish, to meet their targets in their projects. The second uh, aspect aspect in this framework is authenticity. The PBL is an authentic product, which means it's connecting the real world with the students own life, with what happens outside the school. And a lot of research showed that uh, this increases both performance and also the motivation, engagement of the students. So the tasks are like real life scenarios. The projects sometimes have like real impact in the, in the lives of the students in the world beyond the school. For example, students uh, came up with a charity organization, charity plan, which helped others uh, in the community, for example. So they have a personal interest in the project. It's authentic, original, and they make their own choices. The teacher is guiding them, giving some options, and the students, as I said, taking the lead here, making the choices. Another aspect, as you can see here, uh, is collaboration. 
according to several research uh, from the business world, uh, collaboration is a very important key skill for the future. They asked CEOs and um, uh, high-ranked uh, administrators, managers in top companies uh, in a research, and also the employers of the companies about the most important top skill they are looking looking for, seeking in their workplace. And the answer was, the result was the ability to work as a team member in most of the researches. It was always uh, one of the top skills needed. So working as a team, being able to work as a team member is a very important skill for the future. So that is also implemented in the PBL. But I'm talking here about a respectful collaboration that really matters. I mean, it's not just saying your word, your ideas, it's listening to the others, considering them, connecting different ideas together. So it's two ways, both ways with your uh, partner or partners. So in a high quality PBL, the task is not really simple to be achieved by an individual student. It's done by a group of people. And this gives them uh, a sense of belonging and uh, it builds some strong relationships as well. So uh, students become more culturally aware and they become more inclusive during their research or studies. So I can here say that PBL is not only a, an academic method, uh, a teaching methodology, it's also uh, building character. It's also part of character education. Uh, uh, therefore, it's very, uh, I think, important from this point of view. Right. So we said intellectual challenge, authenticity, and collaboration. The next is project management. Uh, this is, again, another important skill for the future world, right? Um, and uh, as I said uh, also earlier, teachers have a different role in PBL. Uh, they don't tell what to do, when, how exactly. They don't define the process very clearly for the students about what they need to do. Of course, they give some instructions, but they're not giving what to do exactly step by step. They are leaving this to the students to define. Of course, supporting them, helping, and uh, mentoring when needed, but they want their students to manage their own projects. So project management is an important process in PBL. This uh, can include uh, like uh, the tools and methods, and methods to uh, achieve their project management. And it really helps them for the future as well. Like, Imagine a planting, uh, planting a garden or planning an event, a party, or launching a campaign. All of these things in their real life require a lot of project management skills. So they plan, implement, and evaluate what they do. And moreover, they are expected to use design thinking process in their project management, which means they gather inspiration, they think about the options, they generate ideas, discuss these ideas with their team members, they design what they thought, and then finally they share the story. This is design thinking process with four levels. And it's an important part of high quality PBL. Moreover, we have reflection here another aspect of a good quality PBL. Students reflect on their work. It's a process, learning process. And they ask questions about what they have learned. How could they do better? What they need to change? What is the future work? They always come up with that, these kind of questions throughout their work. And I think this is also uh, important for metacognition, learning to learn, thinking about our own thinking. 
And John Dewey, uh, a century ago, said, we don't really learn from our experiences. We learn from reflecting on our experiences. And it's true for the students as well. So they decide what is done first. They justify what is done and why. And then they continue with critic from outside or in, and also inside about evaluation of their results. And then finally discuss this with all these previous levels with what really matters, what can be done in the future. And they present all of them in a public product. So peer feedback is important here and uh, self-regulated learning is taking place. If you are familiar with uh, John Hattie's research, uh, you can see that uh, one of the most effective learning uh, methods or tools is self-regulation or metacognition. It's a very high impact, strong evidence with research and very low cost. Students learn how to learn. And one of the aspects of metacognition is review, evaluation of what they learned. And this is really implemented in a high quality PBL. And uh, that really helps them to learn better, to progress and increase their attainment. And finally, uh, a high quality PBL has a public product. This is uh, sharing their results or the final end product at the end with the audience outside the school, outside the classroom. They don't just present their work to their peers in the class. Maybe we invite parents or other people from the community. Maybe they present this virtually online to the outside world. So the presentation is not done for the teacher only. It matters for the others as well. And they receive all this feedback from all parts and they improve their public speaking skills. They are showcasing their uh, creativity, their work uh, in a public presentation. So this is basically uh, the six criteria aspects of high quality PBL framework. And I hope this gives you an overall understanding, an idea or expectations from a uh, high quality PBL. Right, let's move on now to the next slide. I'm not going to spend so much time here on this slide because uh, we already talked about it. It takes maybe another hour, another webinar to discuss the details of these gold standards. But uh, if you go to the pblworks.org, you will find these standards and the guidelines. And uh, you will see that there are seven essential project design elements there. So if we are doing a PBL, we expect students to have a challenging problem. They have a sustained inquiry. It's authentic, as I said, connected with the real world. They have a voice and choice and they reflect on what they learned and they change, modify what they do. They accept critique and revision and at the end, they have a public product. The next uh, diagram here, the green one, is for the gold standard for PBL, seven, seven aspects for teaching practices. For, it's for teachers and administrators mostly. Uh, and here you can actually see what teachers actually do uh, to implement a successful PBL in school. They design it, they align with the standards, they build the culture because it is at the end uh, a mindset that needs to change during this process. And they manage all these activities. Scaffold the student learning. So uh, giving a good PBL project to the right level of the students at the right time. This is important. And as they do the project PBL, student teachers are helping scaffolding step-by-step step going with them to achieve the goals and assessing their learning at the end, engaging and coaching, as I mentioned earlier. Right, now that was the theory. That was why we need PBL, why it is so important, how it is linked with the 21st century skills and what are the gold standards for a high quality project-based learning. 
let me now give you some examples from different subjects, different great groups. And I got some of them here uh, from the pblworks.org. You can also find the others from this website. There are over 70 examples from very different subjects at different levels there. You can actually adapt it uh, according to your own context. Uh, one of them is from Matt's class in the high school. Uh, it's called, I ought to save some money. So the students here have a role of um, client consultant. How do I know if a car is a good deal? That's the question. That's the challenging inquiry-based question given to the students. So they need to calculate the price, discounts, you know, the credits, down payments, the real cost versus you know, the actual cost, secondhand or a new car, you know, the fuel consumption, hybrid options, a lot of things. I mean, st students actually take the role of a person who wants to buy a car and they are, or they are helping a client to give the best decision here. And uh, there's a lot of calculation, as I said, and they consider the short-term and long-term uh, costs associated with this, uh, with each option that the client is considering. So at the end, they came up with their results. They present this. Maybe they talk to some uh, sellers. They go outside the classroom, look at the websites, or they go and talk to the people, actual people selling cars, and they present their work. This is one of the examples from maths. Another example from maths and science. Again, uh, one more thing. PBL is a multidisciplinary approach. So if you are doing a PBL in a school, you don't just limit yourself to one subject, to math or science. Sometimes you have cross-curricular links between different subjects. And this is an example for that. Ultimate design challenge. How can we redesign a product's packaging to make it more environmental friendly? Product packaging is an important uh, uh, aspect in business, and uh, it has a lot of uh, processes, materials, maybe sometimes uh, uh, negatively affecting the earth. So students here take the role of an engineer, a design engineer, and uh, they have geometric modeling. They look at the materials, try to make them more sustainable, and they explore the volume, the surface area, how they can fit the maximum amount of product in the least uh, amount of uh, materials. And uh, they produce some prototypes. And at the end, they come up with their solution. Um, but they also consider uh, wasting the least material uh, in their prototype. So this is, a, I think, another good challenge for them to, uh, uh, to work as a PBL project. The third example from this uh, PBL pblworks.org website is uh, the scoop on our stuff. It's from social studies. Uh, and uh, the title is, what is the true cost of the things we buy? As we go for shopping, we find a lot of products and uh, they are uh, maybe coming from very different parts of the world but students are looking at the real stories behind those products and the origin of the materials. And they look at the aspects of, uh, you know, the political, environmental, economic aspects of the, uh, the manufacturing distribution of, the, of those products. And um, they are trying to make a research, publish an article uh, for the audience of potential consumers of that product. Maybe they organize a panel and discuss what they found. And they also present their possible solutions uh, for a sustainable production in the future. You might think that uh, PBL is difficult. It's, uh, it might be a very challenging to implement in your schools. I have a different approach here. I want you to consider an incremental development approach 
uh, when you decide to have PBL in your schools. Uh, what I mean is to start with teacher autonomy, start with doing a project directed by the teacher, and then gradually go to the student-led, student autonomy in your PBL. What I mean is maybe you can start by giving a project to the students, telling them what to do, how to do in your first try. So students have an experience of doing a project and you actually discover their strengths and areas of improvement and you guide them, you build some skills with them. And as a second step, I recommend choosing a project from a topic of, from a list of topics. So you don't actually tell them what to do. You give them a list of options and they choose what the best project for them, for each student. So they have a sort of autonomy here. And finally, you can implement learning by doing a PBL, a high quality PBL standard, which was led totally by the students. And it has all these six factors I explained previously. So you can go through an incremental development process and you can actually test your uh, time, your uh, resources, how students, parents, community, your uh, leaders at school reflect on this, and then incrementally you can adjust your program to the high quality PBL at the end. So it's a journey, I think. I would like to now tell you a story how I uh, experienced this uh, from my previous school when I was working in Constanza teaching physics to high school students. Um, I was teaching mechanics in physics. And one day I gave my students a project. Imagine like this is like the first step in the previous slide. And the project was about a mousetrap car. So I asked them to um, build a mousetrap car, a car which is powered only by a mousetrap. So they had to design their own version. They have limited materials. They can only use the mousetrap as the power source for the car. And I told them that we will have a race at the end. And the, the car which goes the furthest at the, short, at the shortest time, the fastest and so on, they have a criteria, would win the race and they will get good grades from that. And that was a kind of motivation behind the project. So uh, one of my students was uh, getting average grades in physics. He was like seven and eight out of 10 most of the time. But when I gave this project, he brought me a blueprint of a perfectly designed mousetrap car. I was really impressed by the details of his work. I noticed that he has some really interesting, really good engineering design skills. And he didn't really surprise me. He did the best car in the group. He won the race. And I discovered his skills. In the first year, he built a mousetrap car. In the second year, he had a couple of options and chose to make a digital microscope. He turned a webcam into a microscope, controlling with a manual box. And he participated some. Uh, competitions outside the school. The first year was only inside the school with his classmates. The second year, he went outside the school to different countries. I remember we went to Bosnia at the time and he got the first place. That was an extra motivation for him. After that point, I was not instructing him anymore. I was not teaching him what to do next. He was taking his own decisions. In the third year, he built an ROV, remote operated vehicle, an underwater robot. And he joined a couple of other international contests and got really good results from there. So he was improving his skills and advancing his techniques 
and building something even more complicated every year. In his final year, he built a model UAV. And uh, I remember he joined Infometrics com com competition in Romania, and he got a very good result there as well. So as I said, this was his success story, and it didn't happen immediately. It took some time. Maybe this is an individual example, but still uh, inspires me, still gives me the hope and uh, enthusiasm to work with students uh, to find uh, these kind of students or to support them, to help them uh, for their future. Before uh, um, this presentation, uh, I was talking some of our, to, to some of our teachers in the International School of Bucharest. I was actually invited uh, to another conference a couple of years ago. And uh, at that time also, I told them to tell me how they want to talk, uh, to send me some ideas of how they apply creativity in their own classroom. Told them, tell me your experience. Tell me what you do to implement creativity in your classroom. So from now on, until the end of the slides, I'm going to show you, share with you some of the best uh, project examples, PBL examples from the teachers that I worked with in my previous school. I hope it will also give you an idea and uh, maybe it can inspire you uh, in your own subject to do something similar or uh, even further doing something better. Our ICT teacher told me that in year seven, is asking them to build their own mobile application. Our maths teacher said, the project is to create your own encrypted message out of 30 different ideas. I have just selected some of them here. In science, imagine your teacher is telling you to write a blues song or hip hop song about photosynthesis. So multidisciplinary approach again here. Some students are really good at, uh, you know, singing, writing a song and so on. And why not we just merge this with the information that we give in science. In PE, the teacher is telling them to invent their own game. You set the rules, you are the owner of the game, produce something and let's play. Another idea, another example is from English. Make a press conference for the characters that you read in your class, for example, or a radio advert using your iPad. Create a podcast interview with the characters of the novel that uh, we are reading or even producing a board game. You can see a lot of creativity in action here. In the history class, year eight students studying industrial revolution are creating a transport link between two cities. They have to decide whether it's by train or roads, the cost effectiveness, uh, the, um, uh, the usability, and everything else. In art lesson, students are asked to design a prototype to create a concept sports shoe. In psychology, they learn different research methods uh, and they need to suggest an alternative way to a case study, given case study. In business, Create your own company. Build your business plan as they go through the chapters and present your work at the end of the term. In global perspectives, it's an, another lesson here. Create a fictional social profile. I really like that. There is a, a website called classtools.net. And uh, one of the tools is fake book. So students are actually building a profile 
on the fake book and filling it with the information that they know about that person. I think that links with what they learn and uh, what they experience in everyday life because all students are using social media more or less. And this gives them some authenticity here. You might think that PBL is only for high school students, but it's not true. You can even apply PBL in early years. This is uh, something I got from the latest newsletter of the International School of Bucharest. Four or five year old kids are given a project. They have to create their own zoo and they have to keep them safe with enclosures. And by the end of the project, they describe the animals, they solve some riddles, they increase some control and coordination techniques, they retell the stories, and uh, they improve their vocabulary. They develop their observation skills by classifying animals, for example. They compare the length, size, shape of the weight of the animals. So it's an implication in mathematics. And at the end, they draw, they paint, they create those animals. So uh, there are a lot of aspects from different domains, different disciplines in school. And one project can actually gather them all, even at the early years level. And I took this photo from uh, one of the boards in the, our kindergarten. It tells uh, what means to have a dirty uniform of a student. The student says, I'm sorry that my uniform is dirty, but it helps me to show that I have been learning today. So if you are a parent, especially for the early years or lower primary, and your child is coming with a clean, nice, tidy uniform, you might question the learning happening in the school. It says here, painting helps me to develop my creativity. That's why I have this dirt here. This mark is from the playground. I'm playing with the mud, with the plants. I'm discovering the world. Sometimes I glue the things together to make my art project. That's why I have this green paper here. Sometimes I do some experiments, and that's why my uniform is wet. And this is a part of my lunch. When I'm trying to eat, I'm using a spoon and correcting myself, improving my motor skills, and so on. So uh, I just wanted to share this beautiful idea and uh, a good representation of learning by doing. Learning by doing has evidence in student lives. Maybe it has a price, like a dirty uniform, but I think it really works. Another uh, activity I wanted to share with you is called Enterprise Day. This was actually shared, uh, shown on national TV when it was first done. Students here are getting some roles, five team members, they design their company names, logos, and the mottos. Each student has a specific role. They work together to make, to buy, and sell gifts for the Mother's Day. So their ultimate aim is to produce a product for the Mother's Day gift on the 8th of March. And one of them is a project manager, the other one is salesperson, another one is financial manager. So they need to work together to make this business work. And uh, we have seen that it really worked perfectly well. It engaged a lot of students with huge enthusiasm. We had a lot of good response from the parents, especially the mothers, of course. And it was also taking the attention of the uh, local media here. So the artworks at the end are presented. There is a public event. St parents and other people are coming, buying with the fake money and donating to the school. And the school is also using this for charity or for buying some resources at the end. 
I'm sure you have some sort of similar activities, events happening in your schools, but we might think to integrate those kind of activities within the curriculum parallel to the standards of a PBL in a multidisciplinary uh, action in the schools. Then the effect will be multiplied, it will be more uh, powerful. Right. My next slide is another example from primary school. This time we go to year three. In year three, uh, students are asked to research, prepare and try healthy snacks. We want them to have a healthy eating habit. So it's a step-by-step -step process. They complete a food journal first. They look at what they actually eat at home. Then in the second step, they discuss with their parents and create their own healthy menu. And they decide what to do, what to prepare as a healthy choice. And they create a shopping list. They calculate the cost. There is some mathematics skills here. They create a recipe. They design a poster. They explain step-by-step step what to do to make a healthy lunch. And then they prepare this food at home and they bring it to the school, share it with their class, get their ideas, opinions. And there is a final event at the end of the term. They bring all their menus together and uh, they present and teachers evaluate their work. I think this is a, another good idea for PBL in action, which is touching a real world scenario right? It's about building an important skill, healthy eating. And it is um, using maybe technology tools, mathematics, building a poster, talking to their parents, preparing a journal, and making the food itself. There is a product at the end. So in PBL, we start the product and product in our mind first. And then we build those skills in time. Right, how do we evaluate then all of these projects? Here in Romania, we have a competition called First Step. We bring all those projects together every year in March, February, and then we evaluate them. And uh, of course, celebrate the achievement of our students together. And I just wanted to show you one slide about the evaluation criteria of our competition. It's a verbal feedback, first of all. It goes from unsatisfactory, poor, fair, good, and excellent. And we look at nine domains of each project. We first look if there is a personal in interest, if there is a good reason why students chose the subject, how much they are involved in this decision. And then we look at problems statement. Did they really mention the problem well? Do we know what the problem is clearly stated at the beginning? Thirdly, we look at the originality and creativity. Is it done before? What is the contribution of the students to make something new? How much it's valuable to the society? Is it reusable? Are there any different approaches or different uh, methods to approach the same problem? Is there a product or a prototype of the product at the end? What are the materials used? Are they sustainable? What are the methods, scientific methods that they use during this process? Did they think, evaluate, remember the reflection part, about the future improvements? How could they do much better in the future? And what can they do different? How did they present their work, display, portfolio, or documentation? And we asked them to record a two-minute video, a project video, and has also other standards there. And finally, how much they have understood what they are doing. What is their presentation? Are they prepared for that? Did we reach the project targets at the end? All these uh, criteria uh, from nine different domains added up to give the final score or the evaluation of the uh, student. And we celebrate, as I said, 
their progress and achievement at the end in a public event, in a, especially um, uh, when we invite parents and other community members. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we did this virtually this year. It was an online competition, but hopefully we will continue doing it uh, in the next years normally uh, in our schools. Right, this is uh, almost coming to the end of my presentation. I hope you had an idea of the skills needed for 21st century education. I hope you got the idea of why PBL is important, why it really matters. I hope you got the definition of high quality PBL. And I hope you have seen some meaningful examples some case studies or uh, you know uh, PBL stories from our own schools. But before I finish and show you a couple of videos at the end, I want to tell you that this was just the theory, maybe a small demonstration as well. Uh, according to a research Joyce and Showers made in 2002, there are different types of learning situations and they have different impact in classroom. So when you have a professional learning like we do now, you have some knowledge, you gain some skills, and we want you at the end all to transfer these knowledge and skills into your classroom, the implementation. According to this research, if we just talk about the theory, you, of course, gain some knowledge. There is not really too much about the skill and no transfer. If we give a theory plus demonstrate how it is done, then this percentage can go up to 30, 20%. But still, the impact is very little, exceptional. When we give the, the theory, demonstrate, practice with you, and then give some feedback at the end, then the knowledge and skills go up to 60%. And there is a little impact in the classroom, but still 5%. What is really hitting here, I mean, uh, standing out, is the factor of coaching, mentoring. If you do all of this plus coaching one by one or mentoring teachers, with, with teachers who are doing this already in your own context, then this impact, knowledge and skills can go up to 95%. This is the result of a very important research. And I think it's very meaningful. It's really important. And if you would like to implement PBL in your own context, in your own schools, uh, we really need to consider coaching, mentoring, in addition to demonstration, practice, and feedback. So I have just uh, selected a one minute video here uh, to show you a short video to show you about our project exhibition. Uh, if I'm allowed to show, I can stop sharing and opening YouTube to uh, leave you with uh, this short video. It's in Romanian, I'm skipping this part.
you can see the students how proud they are with their projects. And secondly, in my last video, one minute, is about an international project competition in Romania. Right, I think I have the also later. Some information about my university, Erasmus University, is in Rotterdam, as I said, it's one of the largest in the Netherlands. All right, I think that's all from me. Uh, I have seen some students from Indonesia in our informatics competition before, so I think you already know they were really good projects. I congratulate you all. Uh, I hope this pandemic will be over and we will run this contest again and welcome you all in Romania soon. Now this year it will be given to Mexico. Uh, they will make the uh, online version and the following year, hopefully, maybe we'll meet in Mexico together for the Informatics Project competition there. Mr. Zikri, it's uh, all from me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and I hope uh, it just maybe opened some doors, some understanding. Uh, I'm always ready to help support whenever you need. Uh, I have left my email and the presentation with the moderators. I think it will be shared with the participants and we can get in touch for future talks. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sinan Kosak. Uh, there are two questions that I choose from the a lot of questions uh, asked by the participants. So I will uh, ask you two questions maybe from the participants. Is it okay? Sure, I hope you chose the easy questions. <laughs> okay, so the first question is <clears throat> uh, briefly from Mr. Halir Aral. And he asked briefly, what skills does a teacher must have to manage high quality PBL? Right, it's a very good question. Uh, I have mentioned uh, briefly about that in my presentation. If you um, uh, remember the gold standards, I think these are the skills needed for the teachers. First of all, it's about planning and designing uh, PBL from the very beginning. And then, uh, preparing inquiry-based questions. So questioning skills is very important. There is also project management. As students are doing their projects, teachers are also doing a project there, actually. They, are, they need to supervise each student's project and give them the enough support and make sure they are in line with the standards. So making this curriculum mapping and the standardization is also very important. Uh, it's, it's an important skill for the teachers there. They need to have time management, meeting the deadlines, scaffolding the learning. They don't give a big bunch of you know, information all at once. They cut into small pieces and deliver this in time. And they embed this information into the curriculum. That's not easy, that takes time. It needs a lot of professional learning and development. Uh, but at the end, it's about engaging and coaching. I think teachers should have also some coaching skills. It's not about like making an exam. It's not something similar like giving a work, telling the instructions, and then evaluating what they have done at the end. It's about 
walking together with them in this long journey and supporting, helping students to achieve their goals. Okay, I thank you very much. Uh, and then another questions, one more questions from Mr. Ari Yuxel. Uh, he, uh, uh, he asked, what kind of continuing professional development are required to apply PBL in a school? Right. Um, as I said in my presentation, there are some uh, institutes uh, which are working on this field very intensely. Uh, they are funded by big institutions and continually giving some opportunities, resources to the teachers uh, to learn more about PBL. Uh, these kind of programs can be found online like pblworks.org or hqpbl.com. Those websites actually link to some training options. Uh, but um, in my personal opinion, it's better to have somebody from the house who is actually applying, doing this well, to model for the others. Because every school can have a different context. What works here in Romania might not be really adapt well in Indonesia. So if you have a successful uh, role model uh, in your own country, in your own context, that teacher can actually guide the others and help them to achieve uh, this process progress in, in time. I think that would be the best approach. Okay. It takes time. Yeah. You cannot really have this training in two days, three days, maybe months will be needed for continuous uh, development, but I think uh, it can start from somewhere. Yeah. And our participant is on, not only from Indonesia, there's, there's on also from Iraq, from Myanmar, Vietnam, and several other countries, uh, uh, I think. <laughs> so maybe that's all, for, yeah, that's all for today. If you have any questions uh, we did not get to today, or think of new questions uh, please contact the email address can i share your email address yes sure okay so it is sinan kosak at lumina.ro.ro and uh, you can uh, send the questions there hopefully mr sinan will uh, answer <laughs> okay uh, Mr. Sinan, maybe this is uh, the last uh, final remarks from you about this uh, topic. Uh, could you please to share your final remark? As I said, I was really happy to join you and share my experiences. I wish good luck, all the best to all the participants, teachers joining our session uh, today. And for those who celebrate, happy Ramadan and happy Eid. And uh, I'm looking forward to meet you all again. Thank you so much. And bye-bye. Thank you so much, Mr. Sinan Kosak. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar entitled Introduction to Project-Based Learning, Creativity in Action. And I would like to remind you that you can, uh, uh, what is it, click in the link in the chat box to get the certificate and the slide from this seminar. On behalf, on behalf of EduVersal Indonesia, thank you for joining us today and have a